Welcome to another episode of the Sun Foundation's virtual clean water celebration, Clean Water Champions. I know that we've talked about plastics a lot, but plastics are an issue. Why would they make something that lasts forever and use it for disposable items? What can we do to reduce the amount of plastics in our life? Steve Wilson worked for Five Gyres, and then he created this wonderful documentary called Stories and Stuff. Let's see what we can learn from Stiv about reducing plastic waste. Hi there, everybody. Um, as Brian said, my name is Steve Wilson, and I'm a surfer who's really interested in garbage. And how I got interested in garbage was surfing uh, on a small beach in the Pacific Northwest where I live. I live in Portland, Oregon. And I came in one day after surfing some waves and there were uh, sea lions and there was a sea otter out there and I was communing with them. And I came in and I saw something that changed my life forever and it was a bunch of plastic garbage. And so it set me on this path. Uh, I've always been a kid who loved water. Uh, I swam as a kid in the lakes and rivers of Minnesota, and I grew up skateboarding and snowboarding, so becoming a surfer was a next, a next natural progression. And that led me to this journey, and in this journey has now taken me all the way around the world sailing. So I work for an organization called Five Gyres, and what I'm going to do today is show you what it's like. Who's ever heard of the garbage patch in the ocean? Anybody? Well, there's areas in the ocean where stuff that doesn't biodegrade, plastic, hangs out in the ocean for a very, very long time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you out there with my photographs from my journeys. So when did this all start? So you guys are all too young, and I'm actually too young too, but in the very, very late 60s, we started using disposable stuff. This is an ad from a Life magazine, and this was the beginning of what we call a throwaway society. Well, as Brian said earlier, where is a way? I'm gonna show you where a way is today. But first, let's understand what a gyre is. So my organization, Five Gyres, is, works, for, works in five very uh, big oceans in the world, the North Pacific, the North Atlantic, the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And in these oceans, there are gyres. A gyre is a very simple thing. Basically, you have two different winds that oppose, one higher, one lower, all the way across the ocean, traveling over the Earth. And when those travel over the Earth, they bend. And so what you get is a big, big whirlpool. And stuff that comes off of land is going to collect there. So what you're looking at are the places where I've sailed. And what you're looking at is if a satellite were, it's not a satellite image, I'm sorry, but if you were to put a buoy out into the water that was pinging its location every day for 10 years, this is where it would go. So I've been able to sail now across four oceans with my organization, and these are the expeditions we've done. And we are the only people to have ever studied this plastics problem in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're a little different than other research organizations, and we're a lot less boring, I say, because we sail. And it's a lot cheaper to sail across the ocean than it is to motor across the ocean. So one of the problems is, with, with normal research in the ocean, is you only get scientists out there well, we wanted to change that model, and so we started to take surfers out there, artists out there, filmmakers, uh, photographers, students, teachers, and we've even taken people as young as you out to the ocean. So what do we do out there? This contraption is called the Manta Troll. And what we do is we deploy this every 50 miles or so as we go across the ocean, and we just skim the surface to see how much plastic is out in the ocean. And so after about an hour, we pull it in, and we get about a half a glass full of plastic fragments. 
And this is what it looks like. This is a sample from the North Pacific Ocean. And what you're looking at is what biomass or plankton, that's the squishy looking stuff. And the colored stuff is all plastic confetti fragments. Plastic doesn't biodegrade. So it never truly goes away in a meaningful time frame. But sunlight will break it into smaller and smaller pieces. And this is the stuff that fish eat and birds eat that causes them all sorts of problems. So there's this notion that it's like an island out there. It's not an island. It's more like a plastic soup. So these are actual samples you're looking at. And when you pull up a sample, you're going to have mm, crabs and little fish and plastic. But every time you sample, you're going to find plastic. So it gets a little rough out there, too. And you sleep in really close quarters with people. I mean, the bunks, they're basically bunk beds. And the person sleeping above you is right there, right on your face. So uh, the only place you can get away is to go to the back of the ship and steer. And this is me in a storm in the South Atlantic. So one of the issues with plastic, too, is we're trying to estimate how much is out there. And it's really difficult because when the waves come up, it will actually drive down into the water column. So this is what it looks like on a storm. So, and you look out the back of the boat, we have our trawl out there collecting plastic, but we're not getting the stuff that's way down into the ocean, even as deep as 300 feet being driven down. So we're vastly underestimating what's out there. There's big stuff, too. When, when, when we went across the North Pacific, we observed a plastic uh, particle or a big object every one and a half minutes for 35 days going across the ocean. And this is like a big buoy that would be used to as a bumper for a ship uh, so it wouldn't crash into a dock. So why is this a problem? Well, plastic isn't just in the ocean, it's part of the environment now. So you have animals and plants living on this stuff that shouldn't be there. And they're traveling all the way across the ocean. And, and sometimes they can be species that shouldn't be in one ocean and they're traveling to the next. And that's called an invasive species. So what you're looking at in this picture is a piece of a melt crate that the sunlight is broken into smaller pieces, and weeds are growing on this, and there's little critters living on this stuff as well. And as you can see, this is a piece of a plastic bag that we pulled up in the North Atlantic, and that white thing uh, on the corner is a little animal called a bryozoan. And a bryozoan kind of looks like coral, but as you can see, animal and plastics are living together in ways that they shouldn't be. So the other problem is the fish are eating this plastic. This was a fish that's about this long. It's called a rainbow runner that my boss caught in the North Atlantic, and he was going to eat it. And so he was filleting it to cook it up to eat. And what did he find inside? 18 pieces of plastic. Well. We don't think that's good. And the problem with fish eating plastic is the plastics concentrate a bunch of different pollutants that come off of land. And so when bigger fish eat little fish, that biomagnifies up the food chain. So the fish you and I eat, at the very base of that system, is little fish eating plastic. So one of the problems is that can cause a, a fish to be able uh, to not be able to reproduce, not be able to move very quick. And if this dolphin had a bunch of plastic in its belly, it wouldn't have been able to jump out of the water and uh, pose for my photograph. So what can you do about this? Well, first of all, you need to look at the world as a place that has finite resources. And one of the easiest things you can do is to use reusable things. So plastic bags, I've worked very, very hard in many cities around the country, and I'm actually starting to work in Chicago as well to get rid of these plastic bags. 
The average person uses four to 500 of these a year, and one reusable bag solves that problem. Plastic bags are particularly bad in the ocean environment because they look like jellyfish. And one of the, one of the animals that is main staple is jellyfish are sea turtles. So sea turtles will see a plastic bag floating by in the ocean, they'll mistake it for a jellyfish, they'll eat it, and it can, it can cause them incredible, incredible problems. So this is a picture of two of the people I work with, Anna and Marcus, who started the Five Gyres organization that I work for and took me on board. And when we started a campaign to ban bags in my hometown of Portland, Oregon, we thought this would be a pretty good shot to send to our mayor, and we did. And after about a three-year campaign, we banned plastic bags in Portland, Oregon. So what does this plastic look like out in the middle of the ocean? Well, this is what a garbage patch looks like. So if you were to imagine sort of the night sky, and in the night sky you have stars. So if you just take that image and you put it down onto the ocean, what you're essentially seeing is the stars represent plastic and the night sky represents the ocean's surface. So it's really spread out. Here in the Atlantic Ocean, they have, uh, th there's a, a weed that grows uh, ubiquitously around there called sargassum. So sargassum is going to aggregate a bunch of plastics, which means it's gonna collect a lot of plastic in it. So we sailed by this little patch, and in this little patch of weeds, there were about four to 5,000 pieces of plastic. And that's only in about a 20 by 20 foot square. Sargassum, even though it looks kind of gross, is actually really important for little animals to avoid big animals from eating them. So when baby sea turtles hatch and they go out to sea, this is where they go in the Atlantic for protection. And so when there's a bunch of plastic out there, they're gonna mistake it for food. So this is a really strange photo in that this is a bucket that was floating by the boat and we picked it up and inside it was a fish that was living in this bucket. And the fish had swam into this bucket and couldn't turn around because of its size and it actually grew bigger than the opening of the bucket. So to set the fish free, we had to cut the bucket open and we put it in some water, made sure it was okay, and we put it back into the ocean. So what does the big stuff look like? Well, anything you find in the grocery store, you're gonna find out in the middle of the ocean. It's a really sad fact, but it's true. So some of the stuff you find out there are mop squeegees, or you find bucket lids, or you find antifreeze or oil bottles, and that's stuff that we just picked up with little nets going by the boat. So how much was out there? Well, you got to remember, even though our ship's going to look pretty big when I show you the video, it's really, really small compared to the size of the ocean. The ocean is 70% of the Earth's surface, and our bodies are 70% water. So. When we're going through the ocean, we're only seeing a very small portion of it, but this is how much plastic we picked up. Now, we don't study the big stuff, but what we do is we take photos of it and we collect it and we spread it out so that we can communicate to people like you how big a problem this really is. So this is our boat, and this is my second trip across the ocean, uh, across the South Atlantic. We start off from Brazil, and we've got a crew of people from all over the world. I think the youngest person on this trip was 16 and all the way up to about 55. So very, very diverse kinds of people out uh, on our ship. And so to avoid being boring scientists all the time, although I love science, is we'll, we'll, we'll take a lot of pictures and a lot of videos. And I'm gonna show you some films from our trips. But to get some good shots, we need to do some pretty extraordinary things. So this is one of our interns, his name's Steven, and we hiked him out on this pole to shoot uh, the boat and get better images for us. 
And this is a pro surfer named Mary Osborne, and we uh, put her in the water when we came a, a bunch of garbage when we came across a bunch of garbage, and we took a photo of her with it to sort of show what it looks like underwater. And this is a picture of me. Now, one of the funny things about finding this stuff in the ocean is you don't really know where it came from because all the writing tends to, uh, the, the, the labels and stuff will come off. And we found this bottle and I've been searching for what kind of product this is and where it came from in the world. Because this bottle could have started in the Indian Ocean, went all the way across the Pacific and all the way into the Atlantic where we just picked it up. So, this is pretty cool. This is a whale. This is a minke whale. And we were just about 500 miles away from South Africa, sailing across the ocean. And this whale showed up. And she hung out, and she was close, like from here to the other side of the stage, from the boat. And she was just hanging out with a boat, surfing with us for about 25, 30 minutes. But a minke whale is what's known as a baleen whale. And what a baleen whale does to eat is it just goes through the water with its mouth open, filtering all the little critters there. And that's how it eats. So it was pretty hard on us uh, emotionally because we realized she's taken a lot of this plastic stuff in through her body. So this is us coming into South Africa after about 35 days at sea. Uh, we had a lot of storms and so we were pretty happy to get to land. So one of the things I do is I say I travel to the world's most exotic places to look at garbage. And that may sound like a funny job, but this is uh, South Africa, and this is how a lot of people live outside of the bigger, bigger towns. And there is no away here. There's nowhere to throw your garbage. So the garbage just collects in the environment. And a lot of places in the world are like this. So this is what it looks like. There are no trash cans. There are no people coming to pick up your trash. It just blows around, goes into the countryside, and gets into the ocean. And just about a mile away, I took this photo of a penguin. And right up the beach from this penguin is a bunch of garbage coming off land. So to give you an idea of what it's like to be out at sea, I'm going to show you a film from our expedition here. This is not just another sailing voyage across an ocean. Thirteen people from different walks of life, with different expectations, all aboard a research vessel for 30 days, sailing to a place rarely observed by the human eye. We are heading into the unknown. That way, east for about 3,300 miles. We've got uh, 28 days, 29 days to do that. We plan to be there um, early December. And we'll go straight through the middle of the uh, South Atlantic uh, gyre, uh, looking at the uh, plastics there in the ocean. Uh, we're going to get some fresh food and local produce and uh, we will get some fuel on board as well.
planning on spending just over four weeks at sea, transecting through the middle of the South Atlantic, through the gyre. It's our goal on these expeditions to empower people with education and an authentic vantage from Gyre Central. Now, no one's been out to this part of the world to investigate this particular problem of plastic marine pollution floating on the ocean surface. This is the first time. There's an incredible amount of plastic out here, thousands of miles from land, which is actually polluting this beautiful wilderness. Seeing that I mistaked marine life for plastics made me realize how simple it must be for marine life to mistake plastics for food. Pollutants and plastics may be uh, bioaccumulating up the food chain. Well, the apex predator of that food chain is ultimately humans. It's pretty sad to see how many small pieces of plastic are out in the ocean affecting not only marine life, but possibly humans as well. And when you think about plastic everywhere, it's a pretty startling issue. It's a pretty, pretty difficult thing on the senses to get your head around. This is the, the fourth of five large subtropical gyres in the world. And like the others, this one is full of marine plastic pollution. Um, and for me, it was always about looking forward, looking towards the next wind shift, uh, the next weather system competing against the other boats. But for the first time with this project, I've been forced to actually look down into the ocean and see what's there. And it's just been a revelation. It's just opened my eyes to the fact that there is a huge amount of plastic here in the ocean. Um, and we discovered that for the first time for me in the North Atlantic early this year, and now again here in the South Atlantic. Daily we're sailing past pieces of plastic, plastic water bottles, plastic film, plastic fishing light, plastic packaging, plastic crates, and photodegraded particulate pieces of plastic as well. So it's been a, a real eye-opener. We've been trawling day and night every 60 miles across the South Atlantic Ocean, and every single sample has contained Plastic pollution. One, two, three. We've been finding small broken down pieces of plastic, uh, like pieces of water bottles or toothbrushes, lighters. It's like a plastic confetti across the entire surface of the ocean. When we use our nets to skim the surface, you get that, that little handful of confetti in every trawl. And it's really every trawl. We left Rio de Janeiro two weeks ago, began trawling within a couple hundred miles. First trawl, plastic. Next trawl, plastic. Every one. The trawls now easily have five times more plastic than the first ones. We're in the middle of the gyre, and we're finding exactly what we expected. What we have seen amid the cresting waves is no figment of the imagination, no refraction of light on water. With eyes open to this reality, we are left to save our synthetic seas.
So that was on the way over, and now we're going on the way back over from Africa to South America, and this was our new crew. And we had a bunch of people from South Africa on board, students and teachers as well, and we headed back over, and first day out, this bird flew by. Now, you don't see a lot of animals when you're uh, out in the middle of the ocean. If you, if you see a whale, you're really lucky. If you see a few birds, you're really lucky. This bird is called a wandering albatross. They're very, very rare. So sailors, when they see these birds, take it as a good omen for a safe passage across the sea. And this thing is huge. Its, feet, its wingspan is about as big as mine, about six feet. So how are we going to solve this problem? And how can you help solve this problem? Well, this is a water bottle that came into our trawl uh, when we were about halfway across the ocean. And a girl I work with named Carolyn picked it out of the trawl. And the water inside of it was still fresh. They bet me to take a sip of it. And you know, you get a little bored out there at times. So I did for everybody's entertainment's sake. And sure enough, it was fresh water. Well, the problem with bottled water is that every American consumes about 400 of these bottles a year, and some of them get littered. Just the other day when I got here, I was walking in downtown Peoria, and I saw a water bottle right stuck in a sewer grate. Well, the next time it rains, it's going to go out that sewer grate, it's going to go into the Illinois River, and then it's going to go out the Mississippi, then it's going to go into the Gulf of Mexico, and then it's going to go out into the Atlantic. And it's going to be there for a very, very long time. So the first thing you can do is start using reusable water bottles. Because this is what it looks like out there. This is just a pop bottle. So try and avoid using single-use plastic items as much as you possibly can. Paper biodegrades. So if you can use paper instead of plastic, it's going to be better if it gets into the environment. This is some packing tape from a cardboard box that uh, showed up in one of our samples. But as you can see, the paper has, is just wood, ultimately. It is just biodegraded uh, into the ocean. A lot of strange stuff is out there. Uh, we don't know where this plastic came from or what it was actually a piece of because it had broken apart. But what you're seeing all across this are fish eggs. And so these fish eggs may be for fish that shouldn't be in this part of the ocean. And then you find weird stuff like this is a medical, uh, it's for a shot, a syringe, and you have critters living on it. So when we went across the South Atlantic coming back, we had a chance to stop off at a really cool island called St. Helena. There aren't very many islands in the South Atlantic, and this one is the most populated. This is a town called Jamestown on St. Helena, and about 4,000 people in total live on the island. Well, wherever I go, I'm interested in garbage. And you can learn a lot about how much waste we produce as people when you look in a small environment. So we went to their landfill, and this is the garbage of 4,000 people. And it is massive mounds. And plastic, even when it goes into a landfill, is not going to biodegrade either. So it's going to just accumulate and pile up and pile up. So avoiding it in the first place is a good start. This is coming in to uh, Uruguay, and one of the most beautiful sunsets I've ever seen. It's taking down the sails, about to sail in after about 30, about a month at sea. Uh, we made the front page of the newspaper coming in, and we worked with the locals on some waste management uh, issues in Uruguay. OK, and now we're moving across South America, and this is Easter Island in the South uh, Pacific. So Easter Island is the farthest landmass from any other landmass on planet Earth. So it is literally the most remote place on the planet. And many, many, many years ago, there were tribes of Polynesian peoples there who built these statues called the Moai. And these Moai are about, mm, about as tall as this stage is. And they're all over the place. And so 
how they would compete with each other tribally is they would try to outdo each other making bigger and bigger statues. Well, to get these rocks down to the water where they would set up to carve, they had to roll them on tree trunks to get them down there. So what they did is they cut down the entire forest on the island, and that caused um, a degradation in the environment so they could no longer raise food, they didn't have vegetation, and essentially what happened is these tribes died out fighting over resources. And so now, in the plastic era, you can see this island uh, in trouble again. So I showed you some samples of what it looks like out there when you pull up the trawl. Well, this is if you took a pasta strainer and just waded into the water and went like that. That's how much is out there. It's startling. And this is what the beach looks like there. Plastic from all over the world washes up here. And another problem is entanglement. So dolphins and seals and sea turtles and whales are going to get tangled in nets that fishermen are going to cast off. And we found one of these big net balls floating by the boat, and we pulled it out to see what was in it. And this, this woman wasn't in the net ball. She's just posing in the picture. But we had about 60 different kinds of plastic inside of that net ball and about 60 to 70 different creatures living in it as well. Last summer, we went uh, to Japan. And about two years ago in March, a very, very large wave uh, from a tsunami hit the north of Japan. So one of the ways in which we know how plastic travels across the ocean and how long it's going to stay in the ocean is by seeing how it drifts. But that's really difficult when you pick a piece of plastic out to know how long it's been in the ocean. Well, when the tsunami happened, about 20 million tons of stuff washed out to sea. So we were able to, if we were able to identify it, we would know how long in the ocean it's been there and how long it's taking to get across. So this is a, a children's toy on a beach in the north of Japan. And so if I were a 130-foot wave caused by a tsunami, and I hit this building at about 500 miles an hour, this is what this building would look like afterwards. So as you can see, it pulled everything that wasn't attached to it out to sea. And this is me swimming in the middle of the ocean, which is always a little scary. It's about uh, here, I think it was 15,000 feet deep. So uh, definitely can't touch, and you're definitely in the deep end of the pool. But this is the uh, front of a ship that the back end had broken off, probably where the motor was, that we found bobbing in the ocean. And this was about halfway across. So this took about 13 months to get halfway across the Pacific Ocean. And this was uh, the floor of somebody's house in Japan as well. And it used to be just made out of reeds and wood. And now, as you can see, the white stuff on the bottom is styrofoam that's used for insulation. So what was a totally natural kind of flooring material has now been replaced with something synthetic that's going to stay around, well, forever. So as Brian said, I'm from Minnesota originally, and I grew up uh, swimming in Lake Superior and sailing on Lake Superior. So I tried to get my boss for a couple of years to go study the Great Lakes, because I thought it would be great to take this issue to the middle of America and see what we find, and be able to talk to people like you as well. So last summer we did. We uh, got on this uh, ship. It's actually a Navy ship. Kind of looks like a pirate ship. But uh, I spent three weeks on this ship sailing through Superior, Huron, and uh, Lake Erie. And we found a lot of the similar kinds of plastics out there. Next summer, I will go into Lake Michigan to do the very same thing on the same ship to study. This is uh, nighttime on the ship. I like to put in a lot of photos of how beautiful these lakes and oceans are to remind us of why this resource is so precious. 
So what did we find in the Great Lakes? Well, every time we sampled, the little dots represent where we sampled. We found plastic in different kinds of concentrations. The two dots on the very side of the slide, um, on, the, on your right side, those were the densest ones in Lake Erie. What we found is about 600,000 pieces of plastic uh, per square kilometer. So that is a lot. And they were really, really small pieces. And where were they coming from? They were coming from facial scrubbers. Products that you use to clean your face have uh, an abrasive in them, and they're little plastic beads. And they're going straight down the drain, out the sewer system, into the river, and into the lake. So I'm going to show you another short film about um, that expedition in the Great Lakes. Uh, we were with a bunch of students, like yourselves, and then I'm going to talk about some solutions to this problem and what you can do to help. I'll give you an idea of what it was like to be out in the Great Lakes this summer with this short film. So what are we going to do about this problem? How are we going to solve it when we live in an age where everything we consume is packaged in plastic? Well, we got to get empowered because you guys are going to inherit this mess. 
So I don't know what you want to do when you grow up, but I got a pretty cool job. And what I do is I fight for what I believe in. And what I believe in is clean water for everyone. So this is a girl named Crystal uh, from the Bahamas who thinks the way I do as well. And we took her across the ocean uh, last summer and she went back to the Bahamas and started a campaign with kids and adults to get rid of plastic bags in the Bahamas, one of the most polluted places with plastic in the world. Another woman we took named Tracy Reed lives in Hong Kong, and about two days after our trip across the Pacific, uh, some containers uh, from a container ship spilled all these little plastic BBs, and just trillions of them, and she mobilized 5,000 people to clean them up. Kids, adults, government people, people from industry, they all gathered to try and clean up this mess. And they were able in about two weeks to clean up about 70% of it, which is pretty amazing when you're essentially combing the sand for BBs. So there's this girl who lives in Illinois, in the north of Illinois, named Abby Goldberg, who's going to be sailing with us this summer in the Atlantic. She's 13 years old, and she got concerned about plastic pollution, mainly because she likes sea turtles. So she heard about this bill that was in the Illinois legislature that was sponsored by uh, industry that wanted to prevent any any small town from being able to ban or regulate plastic bags. Well, she didn't like that very much, and she started a petition to stop it. And her petition got over 150,000 signatures, and it got the attention in, of the governor. And the governor invited her to a press conference, and together they got the bill vetoed. So. If you ever think of, of yourself as powerless or you're in a world of adults and can't do anything to make change, well, Abby shows you you can do what you believe in. And believe me, they will listen to you because you are going to inherit the earth um, that we create as adults. So always feel empowered, get involved, get involved in cleanups, make your parents use reusables, go home and tell them about this presentation. And uh, I like when uh, I get to talk to kids because I'm also talking to their parents because I know you're going to go home and tell them not to consume or buy this stuff, right? <laughs> and the stuff that's the biggest problem is the stuff we use for a single use, that we literally use it for 20 seconds and it lasts forever. So this is a beach cleanup I did, and what you see here is plastic bags, bottle caps, cup lids, straws, all the stuff that has a reusable counterpart. The ocean is really, really big, and if we work together, we can stop all this plastic from going in. But it's going to take each and every one of us getting involved, reducing our consumption of plastic, cleaning up the stuff that we see in the street, and so what I want you all to do when you leave here today is I want you to look into the street and if you see garbage, I want each and every one of you to pick up two things. That's it. And what that's going to do is show you what's out there. And you're going to see the stuff that's going into the ocean. And the next time you're in the store, it's going to change how you view packaging. So, a lot of policies around the world about this stuff are springing up, which is great. All those little red dots are where people in the world have said, hey, we're trying to reduce our plastic consumption for a healthy ocean. So that's my job. I sail around the world and I look at garbage and then I work with policymakers and I speak with people like you to try and stop it. And I hope as you grow up and you inherit this world, you'll engage with this world and stop pollution where it starts. Thank you very much for listening to me. Again, we keep coming back to, well, what can I do to make a difference? What can you do? It might start with skip the straw, not using a plastic lid on your paper cup, but 
let's go further. Let's rethink the whole system and end our use of disposable plastic. What can we do to truly be clean water champions?